Um, one more chair up here, Martin. <laughs> and then we can also just kind of hang around the side. We can be cheering on the rafters. Yeah, shut the door. Just, I think. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to scoot everybody. So, <laughs> uh, um, so it, 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 it's a real pleasure to, 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 to welcome Husband and I. Uh, he's currently spending the year at MIT as, as a fellow, and he's also part of the Book Year Project at, at Brown University. As I think most of you know, he'll be joining us uh, at Oxdale next year as a professor in the EWA department. Um, the talk today is a awfully titled Arab Spring Persian Winter Making Sense of Counter Revolutions. And I can't tell you how much I'm looking forward to hearing what uh, Professor and I have to say. Thank you. Great to be here. Uh, come on in. Um, I'm going to stand because I feel like I'm a, a, either a Russian oligarch or. <laughs> you are a Russian oligarch. <laughs> <oligarch. laughs> Iranian clerics. Why don't you guys push forward your chairs in the front? And there's yes, everybody yeah. moves forward. And if someone wants to forward. come and take this chair. Um, 
tampered with uh, by the uh, allies of now President, the nominal President, Nahud Ahmadinejad, um, uh, by either the, the shadowy networks of um, the so-called IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, or um, sympathetic conservative allies in various ministries. Um, what's happened with the Green Movement since has been a sustained um, campaign by the ruling faction, uh, allies of Ahmadinejad, but more importantly by um, uh, elements sympathetic to the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei to not only um, uh, muzzle the uh, the uh, dissident opposition, uh, but also drive a lot of them out of the country. The people who were working for the campaigns, a lot of the um, youth who were exercised about this and had the means have either largely left the country, or if they're inside, they've been silenced and driven underground. Um, and uh, the leaders of the opposition um, have been under virtual house arrest, Mira Saint Musebi and Mehdi Karoudi. Um, the main difference that I think accounts for a kind of a different um, response by the Iranian population as opposed to the Arab public um, has been the sustained um, memory, historical legacy of revolutions in Iran. Iran, as I said in 1905, had a constitutional revolution that promised a great deal, but it was halted. And, um, uh, 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 for various reasons, which I won't get into today, but it had a real kind of a democratic element to it. Um, and then Iran has lived through a series of um, coups and upheavals that were either orchestrated from outside or carried out by um, absolutist monarchs. Um, and the 1979 revolution, obviously, was the last uh, big hurrah that a lot of uh, people participated in from a cross-section of um, society. You had Islamists, you had uh, liberal Democrats, you had um, um, socialist um, uh, uh, activists, you had communists, but the Islamists emerged as, as, as the most powerful bloc. So the memory of big upheavals um, is very present in the minds of Iranians, and I think Iranians as a whole have a very cautious approach um, to um, uh, bringing about uh, another major upheaval because of what would happen afterwards. They have been disappointed so many times that um, uh, they don't want to have a, sort of a huge sudden change. Um, and this is stated in the you know, various public pronouncements of the uh, opposition leaders. Uh, they've continuously said that they want to reform the system and not get rid of it. And uh, if you look at what happened in Iran in terms of the Green Movement, it was largely in response to the 2009 presidential elections. It was not uh, like you had in the Arab world as a result of uh, humiliating uh, weight of the uh, authoritarian state or uh, the rampant corruption. Uh, all of those things exist in Iran. Uh, the response in Iran was largely because of the fraudulent outcome of the 2009 election. So there was a clear grievance. There was a clear reaction to it. It didn't go anywhere. The state came in um, and it, it did a very effective job of silencing the, um, uh, the mainstream opposition, the reformists, and using intimidation tactics and violence and torture and rape and all manner of ugly things to um, either push some of the more uh, progressive elements outside of the country or drive them underground. So that's where things stand uh, with Iran. But other, there are two or three other key distinguishing uh, features in terms of what the silence in Iran um, has been the result of. Um, the opposition, if you look at it, um, the, sort of the mainstream reformist opposition, these are regime loyalists mainly. These were people who, had, who held very high positions in uh, the government in the first couple of decades of the Islamic Republic. Mir <coughs> Musavi was the first prime minister, um, not the first, it was the, he was a wartime prime minister um, uh, after the revolution in Iran, and he served that position for eight years or so. He was a favorite of Ayatollah Khomeini, the founder of the Islamic Republic. Um, Mehdi Karoubi, um, the cleric, uh, lib uh, the liberal reformist cleric, uh, was speaker of the Majlis, the parliament, but more importantly, the head of one of the most powerful foundations 
um, this kind of shadowy network of, of you know, merchants and money and the, the, the guards and various other elements. He was at the head of one of the biggest ones, the uh, Foundations of the Martyrs, or Bunyad Shahid. Um, so these were figures who um, were leading the opposition against the government and were very much wanted to kind of restore the ideals of the revolution that they felt had been lost in the uh, years since Khomeini's death, although if you come from a more progressive side of the um, uh, opposition, you can very plausibly and validly actually argue that um, they had a very conservative approach to reform, and therefore, you know, uh, most of the population or a critical mass within the population never really identified with them to go on the streets and um, um, champion their cause. So you have sort of internal <coughs> Uh, uh, figures from uh, uh, from within the regime who were leading the opposition and were asking for reform, not for revolution. So it was easier for the regime to silence them. Um, the other factor is this is a revolutionary regime. It understands revolutions. It understands what leads to great upheavals. And it was very adept at um, uh, silencing the media. Um, it has been very adept at, as I said, carrying out the campaign of intimidation. Um, it has uh, been very adept at controlling the flow of money that was um, pouring into opposition um, networks. So someone like President, um, former President um, uh, Akbar Rafsanjani, uh, one of the wealthiest men uh, in Iran by all accounts, um, he was funding the opposition campaigns and they went after his um, uh, family his sons and daughters. One of his sons is still in exile, lives in um, England, uh, pursuing a doctorate at Oxford. Uh, <laughs> very convenient for uh, Oxford. He's like a 40 year old, so he can barely speak Farsi, but never mind. Uh, I'm, I'm going to um, uh, side grievances. But uh, uh, Rafs and Johnny and his network were fairly effectively shut down after uh, you know, a few months into the revolution because the regime understood very well that if there was going to be a threat, uh, the money had to come from uh, the likes of Rafs and Johnny. So the financial networks were taken away fairly quickly as well. Um, lastly, the international context with respect to the uh, uh, post-election upheaval in Iran. Um, you have... Uh, nice to see you. Um, you had... Uh, um, uh, uh, you know, an Iran that was fairly isolated um, at the time when... Uh, the post-election upheaval began. And the reason for isolation had to do with the Iran's nuclear program, which all the candidates um, endorsed in one shape or another. Some of them favored more transparency. Um, but by and large, they thought this was a national right. And so Iran uh, uh, had a kind of a dissident class, um, former regime figures who were, reading the, uh, who were leading the opposition movement, who wasn't traveling outside of the country much to be able to lobby foreign governments and get backing and the kind of exposure. So all the exposure you really had to the Green Movement came from those rainy YouTube video images and Twitter feeds and, and what have you. It was really uh, purely at a kind of a popular public level. You didn't have the kind of lobby networks that many of the um, 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 uh, Arab movements by the time uh, the revolution started taking place in Tunisia and Egypt. Um, uh, we're doing in, in Washington, <coughs> London, and Paris, and um, um, elsewhere. Um, so those factors, the nature of the opposition, the international context, the, uh, the strict, <coughs> uh, very repressive um, state of the uh, uh, government. Uh, oh, and one more thing, the structure of power in Iran. It's very diffuse. Um, in contrast to the Arab dictatorships, that you know, you have one man on the top, very clear, rigid structure of security forces uh, underneath him. Iran has a very diffuse network of power. You have <coughs> clerics in all um, provinces uh, throughout Iran uh, being given uh, money and kickbacks by um, uh, you know the heads of the uh, uh, various uh, powerful organs in Iran. The supreme leader himself um, uh, has a very loose, powerful network spread throughout the country, and these people. It's in their interest to keep the regime intact because they get direct benefits. Um, uh, so as opposed to uh, the Arab countries where you had a very kind of a rigid hierarchical system um, that could easily be 
um, uh, shaken by uh, sustained public protests. In Iran, you don't have that. You have too many people who have a stake in keeping the opposition silent. Um, and that, I think, clearly accounts for um, the, you know, the, the brutal um, effectiveness the, uh, and the ruthlessness of the regime. Um, uh, but having said all that, I don't think um, they'll be able to carry this out much longer. Iran suffers from a um, chronic crisis of legitimacy um, that really has been um, the mainstay of Iranian politics ever since uh, the 1905 Constitutional Revolution. And the riddle is that what do you do with unelected officials at the very top of the, um, uh, the political food chain who would like to have some semblance of democratic institutions underneath them um, um, uh, uh, but still very much remain in power. I think what we see with, with Iran today is that the office of the Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, has become exposed um, in a way that it's never been exposed before. And this is the real center of gravity of the regime. So whereas the last round of protests were against the, some of the more you know, apparent unsavory institutions of the regime, the Guardian Council, that that's the candidates who stand for office, uh, the president himself and his allies, um, I think you're going to see the tone of protest <coughs> and be more directed at the person of the Supreme Leader himself. Um, this started to happen in the sort of the second and third week of the um, protests and after the 2009 elections, but um, it is, it's become clear that it's him that ultimately is the obstacle to reform and change in Iran. And you'll find with this massive campaign of um, uh, 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 repressing the opposition, who happens to be former regime figures, you'll, you'll see the regime turn on itself and even those conservative elements who had some sort of sympathy for the Islamic Republic uh, structure of government um, direct their attacks at, at the person of the Supreme Leader. And that's going to be the next battleground, and we'll see that play itself out um, probably first with the majlis elections that are coming up, uh, and then the presidential elections obviously are going to be a big um, um, turning point. Um, the Supreme Leader just uh, a couple weeks ago made this very uh, public bizarre speech where he said, you know, um, Iran um, uh, has had multiple, has exper experimented with multiple forms of um, uh, government and it's not uh, beyond the realm of possibility if we see the office of the president get eliminated. And obviously this was a reference to Ahmadinejad's increasing disagreements with the Supreme Leaders on key appointments to his cabinet. You know, he doesn't get to appoint some of the key people to his own cabinet in, in charge of the um, in, uh, in, intelligence ministry, the interior ministry, the head of the armed forces, and um, uh, uh, in terms of his nominations for the, for the Guardian Council. So as the ultra-conservatives turn on themselves, I think you'll see this unelected body become more and more exposed, and that's going to be the next battleground. So getting Iran closer to the kind of um, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, politics that uh, animated the anti-authoritarian protests in the Arab world. In terms of the Arab Spring, all the opposite, I think, is true. You had these sort of rigid hierarchical systems that was clear. You know, you had some of the longest serving autocrats on top of these governments. It was very clear who the targets were. Um, the international context around um, uh, the protests was very different. You had, you know, in Egypt, for instance, a society that was not as isolated as a country like Iran. You had the kind of the intelligentsia traveling more or less freely, um, especially since the State Department came down hard on Mubarak and uh, forced them to sort of um, uh, loosen some of the restrictions on traveling in and out of Egypt. Um, so people were establishing ties with uh, various think tanks, uh, policy circles in Washington, London, Paris, etc. Um, you had a very pragmatic um, youth population um, that actually uh, came up with a set of um, strategic um, um, uh, uh, goals for how to um, expose some of the most unsavory um, elements of the regime and um, to really um, uh, taunt the government uh, in front of uh, cameras, uh, you know, broadcasting to the rest of the world, um, to do what it usually had been doing um, 
uh, you know, in, in a kind of a secretive fashion. Uh, so, you know, you saw this sort of bizarre spectacle of, uh, uh, you know, Mubarak unleashing that set of sort of, what would you call it, the camels end up on <laughs> or unleashing Tahrir Square to beat people. You know, it's, it was total panic and, a, you know, uh, a lack of understanding of how best to deal with a group they had never seen anything like. So that, those kind of strategies really um, uh, paid off in, in Egypt. But again, I think it ultimately came down to an opposition that was so disconnected from the regime itself. This was not about reform, this was about getting rid of the head of the snake, if you will, and to rebuild institutions. And you see that the difficult part of the difficulty of um, post uh, 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 revolution in Egypt and Tunisia, although Tunisia is done much better than Egypt, has been to sort of come up with solutions for the day after. Now that you've successfully <coughs> gotten rid of um, the, the, the key obstacles to um, democratic change, how do you implement democratic change? And that's where. Um, uh, uh, the Arab world is um, uh, today. Um, in one place in the Arab world that I think uh, you'll see the most rocky uh, uh, journey ahead, but pro probably also the most disappointing, um, uh, I think uh, it'll be Libya. Um, and uh, th here, going back to the factors that, was outline that I was outlining, you'll see the international context was very different. Um, in most of the Arab countries, you had the international um, uh, community sort of stand back and use these sort of informal networks of academics and activists and um, think tanks to get involved. You had no formal government involvement. In Libya, you have overt government involvement in the um, uh, uh, shape of uh, NATO airstrikes but also a very close coordination of intelligence, uh, supplies of arms to uh, the rebels, some of whom are, um, you know, are very unsavory characters indeed. The um, person in charge of security in Tripoli right now um, is basically an ex-Al-Qaeda leader, uh, 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 Commander Bill Hatch, um, who, you know, neither Washington nor um, uh, Paris or London had any problems with him taking the lead over there. So um, I think uh, you'll see in Libya, because the international context was all of a sudden very different and you have overt Western involvement, um, I wouldn't be surprised if there were backlashes and if um, uh, the Islamists who have clearly taken hold of uh, the transition process right now, um, if you know, in a matter of a few weeks uh, or a few months, won't change their tune um, against the West in order to win uh, votes domestically. This happened in Iran. People forget that when Khomeini landed in Tehran, he landed from a suburb of Paris. He had the most wonderful things to say about uh, Parisians and Westerners and the Americans that would, went there and visited him. And he said, oh, we're very thankful for your um, help and all that. And uh, when it became very um, uh, convenient to go against Westerners and to label the secular, liberal, democratic opposition within the country as tools of the West. They changed their tune and you had a kind of a fundamentalist Islamic government that um, has been a, really a monument for um, a hypocrisy um, uh, in, 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 in the region. So I, I'm afraid, I think Libya uh, is the one Arab country that is closest to have a fate of a kind of an Islamic Republic, and that's a good case scenario, because we really don't know much about the um, rebels still uh, to this very day, and then you have the problem of disarmament and all those kind of things uh, 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 that go with it. Um, I don't know how many of you saw that this, it, had, it wasn't reported at all that much in the Western press, but uh, the day after Gaddafi was um, brutally um, killed, um, uh, the head of the transitional national uh, 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 government, um, uh, Jibril, gave a um, sort of a triumphant speech um, in which he saw it necessary to not highlight the kind of the, uh, you know, the difficult road they've taken, the kind of the cautions they must take to make sure that Libya has a democratic, representative, prosperous future, but rather to highlight how Sharia law is going to have a very smooth um, implementation going forward. Um, 
He talked about how the, all the laws are going to be based on Sharia, Islamic banking is going to be put into effect, and bizarrely, um, the practice of polygamy is now going to be um, uh, legal. Um, with, you know, as if the bloodshed and everything else was really to implement um, uh, these uh, wonderful tenets of uh, fundamentalist uh, uh, readings of um, Sharia law. Uh, so I, I think Libya is, is the one that's going to have the most um, rocky road ahead. Um, how are we doing in terms of time? I can go through oh, maybe in five, ten minutes. Um, in, in terms of, I, I just wanted to <coughs> highlight the Tunisian and, and, and Egypt since I've uh, uh, come up with some sort of a metric with which to judge the success of uh, um, uh, democratic uh, or pro-democracy, anti-authoritarian um, uh, movements in, in, in Iran. In Tunisia, you just had uh, elections, which the Islamic al nafta party seems to have done really well, won a plurality of, um, uh, of the votes. Um, um, I think the Turkish model um, for the Tunisians is something, and I've heard this in, or read it in, in speeches of the leader of the al nafta party, uh, Anucci. Um, uh, the Turkish model has really, become a really inspiring model for the Tunisian op opposition, and that's certainly a positive sign. Um, although um, you have to give it more time um, to see which direction this is going to head toward, because um, the allure of power is oftentimes uh, uh, too great for um, not the moderate reformist-minded Islamists, but uh, the ones who are trying to make a name for themselves, and there are a lot of young aspiring um, uh, Islamist leaders um, in uh, uh, movements in both Egypt and in, in Tunisia. Uh, we'll have to see how these people um, uh, you know, go on in six months, in a year, in a couple of years um, time. But so far, the Turkish model seems to be uh, what, what, what they're aspiring for, and I think that's a very positive sign. It, uh, I think the burden kind of falls on countries like um, Turkey, who have been um, really active in establishing a dialogue with a lot of these opposition movements to be able to translate their experiences um, for those contexts. Um, and the government of Turkey has so far taken a very interestingly um, um, uh, quiet but deliberate um, role in, 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 in doing that. Um, and um, we'll see you know, how this rattles the Iranians and and the Saudis. Um, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say a few words about counter-revolution since that's in the title of the talk. But one huge part of the story that I think has been undercovered um, and um, really uh, uh, bears uh, focus on gone quite a bit is the role of counter-revolutionary movements um, in the region mainly funded by the Saudis and the Iranians. The Iranians, in the case of um, Syria, um, uh, especially Syria, uh, but the Saudis really all over the map, but especially in Bahrain, the most um, uh, egregious formats where the Saudis uh, dispatched a thousand military advisors to uh, teach the Bahrainis how to uh, uh, put down the, uh, the majority Shia uh, opposition. Um, the Iranians don't have much to work with. Uh, they have a very uneasy uh, uh, population at home. They're very sensitive. They know that people can easily look up what role the Iranian government's playing in um, Syria, and they uh, really learned their lesson in the first two weeks of the uprising in Syria, where Iranians, uh, the Iranian um, uh, Revolutionary Guards, they sent a bunch of commanders to advise the Syrians, and the interior, uh, the intelligence ministry sent a few of their um, um, agents to go there and uh, give workshops um, to to the Syrian intelligence, but there was a huge backlash all of a sudden amongst the conservative ranks in, in the Majlis in, in Tehran, and the government pulled back, and in their public pronouncements, they've been more critical of the um, Syrian regime. The Saudis are a different ballgame altogether. Not only did they announce this $100 billion uh, spending back package in March for their own domestic audience, basically buying their silence. Um, um, they have um, funded counter-revolutionary uh, 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 groups in um, Egypt. Uh, they've actually been in talks with a lot of Egyptian uh, military generals. Um, 
they've been um, uh, funneling uh, money into um, uh, 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 Libya um, in, uh, at the early part of the um, a campaign, but they see an Islamist government in Libya, uh, a government they can work with very closely. So their interest is to sort of get rid of some of the more um, uh, uh, progressive elements. Um, but Bahrain really has been the, the, the key spot where the um, uh, Saudis have been playing a very negative part. And um, for reasons that are very obvious from, I think, the American point of view, um, uh, the exposure of the kind of work that they've been doing has been very limited in the United States. And in Europe, in the, if you read the London Guardian, Guardian or even the Telegraph, um, you'll see um, uh, you know, exposés of what they're doing on a weekly basis. But here, there hasn't been at all any um, kind of uh, 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 criticism of the, uh, of the Saudi role. <laughs> um, but the, uh, 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 the king has been very public in his um, displeasure with the Obama administration and the fact that they didn't uh, rush to the rescue of Mubarak or they uh, were silent on um, some of the changes that were uh, taking place. Um, and um, uh, you know, we'll have to sort of monitor that closely. If you're looking for hiccups in any of these post-revolutionary movements, um, I say, you know, follow the funding and follow the, some of these characters. And um, if they lead to Riyadh, then um, you know, the, I don't think one should be all that surprised. But uh, one thing I think the United States can do in a very indirect way is to get the Saudis to just you know, cut it out. Um, but that's easier said than done. That's something that uh, we could t uh, talk more about. But um, Iran and Saudi Arabia have, uh, you know, had the most to lose, and um, all signs are that they're kind of um, trying to create a buffer zone between their own populations and what's happening in these other countries. Um, but uh, this is one game that they're not very good at. Uh, as I said, the regime in Tehran is very good at understanding revolutionary movements. Counter-revolutionary uh, work is, is, is much more difficult to carry out um, uh, because, you know, it's, it's not a game of just throwing around slogans and, uh, you know, uh, sending arms. You have to have a kind of a coherent ideology um, that pits a specific interest group against a very large um, uh, uh, dissonant public. And I, I don't see it uh, going much further. Um, but anyway, with all that, let me uh, quiet down, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so, so 10, 15 minutes for questions. Fantastic. Okay. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, Absolutely. Please. Yes. What is, what does, does Iran have any strategic interest in Syria? Yes. Um, from the point of view of the Islamic Republic, yes. I think from the point of view of Iran as a you know, society, of course not. Um, but for the regime, um, Syria is incredibly important um, uh, because it has really provided a, um, uh, what would you call it, a kind of a very friendly atmosphere for Iranian um, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, checks and balances game that the Iranians like to play in the region as a whole. Um, not only they, you know, can um, establish uh, uh, networks of money that would, you know, find its way in the Palestinian territories, or uh, you know, they can have c direct control over groups like Hezbollah. Uh, but more importantly, it uh, provides a uh, ally for Iran in a region that really there are no natural allies. You know, the Arab world is largely Sunni. Um, the Arab countries have historically had a strategic pact against Iran to keep the Persian um, resurgence at bay. You know, historical memories go back 2,500 years in that region in the case of Persian domination. Um, uh, there is a, you know, certainly a kind of a nativist streak um, in Iranian foreign policy that sees itself as a kind of the guardian of the region. Um, and uh, the Iranians have, uh, the Islamic Republic um, has been playing a kind of a losing game ever since the revolution when they were so isolated. And, you know, they, they would take whatever allies they can get their hands on. This is why in Bahrain they're 
playing this kind of proxy war with the Saudis because if they could get this majority population in Bahrain that is Shia, that is um, very friendly toward um, uh, the Islamic Republic, uh, if they could get that on their side, they'll have another chip um, in the back with which they could play politics in the region. But it's really, for power projection, Syria is, is, is important for, for the Islamic Republic. Yes. Um, in, in a practical sense, uh, what do the sort of secular leaders of Iran, what room do they have to criticize Khomeini when he's such a symbol of sort of nationalism within Iran with respects to countering Western influence in the region? This is a very good question. I mean, it, it, so you have these multiple narratives. I think one of the great things that's happened though, since 2009, first in Iran and then because of the Arab Spring in the region as a whole, you finally have had this kind of, um, uh, you know, snow globe where all these sort of various narratives had settled down and people had, you know, um, uh, bought off their own constituencies within them, really shaken out, and no one knows where things are going to land. But one of the most important narratives has been this sort of misplaced, um, and I'll explain misplaced in a, a second, but misplaced anti-colonial um, uh, rhetoric that the Islamic Republic has been using ever since the 79 uh, revolution. That, you know, if you stand in the way of any kind of um, uh, uh, power play uh, that the regime is trying to carry out, then you're a tool of the West. Um, the government hasn't delivered on a lot of promises that it made. Uh, the Iranian Revolution has been a failed exper uh, experiment uh, because it took this Islamist um, uh, flavor so early on, and then the power uh, uh, at play within the clerics um, uh, really turned it into a very corrupt is Islamic state. Um, so the narrative that used to be very convenient for leaders who could justly use it against the West, say, you know, we're doing all these things because of the designs from the outside, no longer applies because the government hasn't provided any kind of um, a positive um, uh, a political um, um, uh, experience for the, uh, uh, for the people. Um, so it's, it's largely misplaced now. So when Ahmadinejad gets up and says something, everyone sort of yawns. Um, in the, uh, it was very indicative in the, in the immediate post-election um, uh, protests. Uh, you know, there are all these um, people charged with chanting slogans that the crowd would have to repeat, you know, Friday prayers and all that. And so, you know, the, the person in charge would say, you know, death to Israel. And people would say, death to Russia. Because the Russians and the Israelis were really helping the regime at that time. And they didn't sever their ties. They um, uh, wouldn't allow a kind of a Security Council resolution be passed against the, uh, uh, the, the government. Um, so, you know, they would say, you know, death to the United States, and people say death to China. Um, so you can see the messages no longer resonate. Um, you can use that sort of a nationalist rhetoric against the superpower outside. Um, and that's also happened in the Arab world. People see it as a kind of an empty um, uh, gesture. But more importantly, and this is, I think, where the Obama, uh, Obama administration deserves some credit, is that for the first time you had the government of the United States not do anything, which is a huge thing. Uh, in and of itself, you know, don't say, don't say negative things, just don't do anything. Um, now, I was uh, talking to Ambassador Shira, and he thinks that this was just accidental. Um, <laughs> there, it, it wasn't, you know, it was actually the administration's, you know, uh, was caught off guard, and they didn't have any kind of coherent side, so they just stayed mom, and it just happened to work. Um, but I think, you know, you could say that there was an initial impulse to back Mubarak, you know, Biden had a few. Um, and not good things publicly and then they quieted him immediately. But I think they got it that actually the best we could do is to not do anything because of this sort of, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, very um, uh, bad legacy of Western involvement that each and every one of these countries have had. Uh, it's just best to sort of stay out and let's play out and let the population see that you're not trying to play any kind of, you know, game. Uh, and I think that's been helpful. The question now becomes is that where do you go as this unfolds? Yeah. Okay. The only thing with that is you didn't mention Israel in that and I'll yes. lobby here for that. Yes. So yes. the Obama administration, especially wanting to be reelected, obviously, and like how, and our, obviously, our best ally. 
Well, the Israelis wanted him to come and support Mubarak. The Israelis okay. saw that, you know, oh, this is going to be 79 throughout the region. We're going to, have, we're going to be surrounded by fundamentalist Islamists everywhere. And they were, you know, um, uh, kind of characteristically, you know, running around this government of Israel, especially saying that, you know, Obama basically gave away uh, the Arab world. I mean, this was that, the, the, the rhetoric, read even, you know, the sort of center left papers like Haaretz in Israel. Um, as these things were unfolded, they were saying, oh, th this is, you know, he's going to be another Carter. He's going to be someone you know, who gave up, you know, the Shah, or, you know, the, the equivalent now. So, um, the, I think the Israelis um, were pushing hard for the administration to take a uh, stance, um, uh, uh, you know, backing Mubarak, and maybe not Ben Ali, but Mubarak was very key for them. Along with, so you had this bizarre alliance with the Saudis and the, the Israelis, you know, really pushing for for, for the Obama administration to uh, to do safe And to their credit, they didn't. I mean, now the question is whether they didn't because Obama seriously, you know, saw this as an opportunity. Uh, if you go back to his Cairo speech, maybe, yeah. I mean, there's a very good, that's a very very good speech that he made over there. And, um, he wasn't Condoleezza Rice because Condoleezza Rice also gave a speech in Cairo. Um, that said very much, you know, the same things that Obama said, but this was Obama, it wasn't the Bush administration, you know, whom a lot of Arabs viewed as actually having designs, and when push came to shove, they wouldn't do anything, it was just rhetoric. Um, but um, I, think they, I think they've, you know, uh, in those in crucial initial stages, they didn't do anything to um, make this not an authentic um, movement that needed to be at that point, um, you know. Uh, I, my side thing is to, uh, you know, my research is on uh, uh, democracy. And, um, you know, democratic ideals and rights ultimately have to be earned. Um, they're not, in spite of what the, you know, founding documents of this country say, they're not, you know, these sort of God-given rights you have to struggle to earn. Some people have to concede these rights. You have to get it from them. Um, and um, that, I think, understanding the importance of that at a key revolutionary moment, um, whether they did it by accident or not, was played a huge part. Um, uh, but since then, I mean, obviously there is more experiences to go around. Yes. Yes, you. Cool. First, thank you very much for coming. This was a good talk. Um, second, this is sort of a hypothetical question, but what do you think uh, we would be looking at now had Western powers gotten more involved in the region earlier? Um, very good question. I mean, that's a um, good hypothetical. My hunch would be that if you, the only reason they would have gotten involved was to keep some of these allies in place. Um, so Mubarak would be in charge, largely discredited, anti-Western sentiments would be to the roof, um, and you would have in the 21st century, in the year 2011, um, a new um, uh, project of Western imperialism that you have a very hard time to defend, um, you know. Um, so, uh, and you have to sort of back up probably with more military and economic assistance uh, to maintain it. It'll be kind of, you know, uh, empire at a scale that um, would sort of harken back to, you know, 19th century levels or something like that. I mean, I'm being dramatic, deliberately, but, uh, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but um, uh, I, I really think that um, the only, uh, you know, they could have intervened, let's say, um, for other purposes, you know, to aid the opposition, but then they would have to sort of provide a compelling narrative as to why they're abandoning these allies, um, and not just abandoning, but going against them in such a, uh, a brutal fashion. I think Gaddafi, you could argue that, um, uh, you know, if you see the kind of the cozying up of the West with the Gaddafi regime since 2006, um, I went to school with Sable Islam in London. He was there. I remember when he was a, you know, the, uh, the main guest at every table, at, whether it was at LSC or, you know, British government, because they wanted to get the old contracts going. And, they had renounced their weapons program. You know, it looked like this was going to be um, a, a huge opportunity for uh, for the West to sort of you know moderate the Gaddafi regime or what have you. 
but you, just, you saw how quickly they turned against him. I mean, I think. Um, um, so, you know, you have to manage all these narratives and not look like a hypocrite. And it's, um, I, I find it very difficult. You know, only silence would have really given you a kind of credibility in this uh, respect. Again, thinking of kind of a ground, you know, from an international space station view of politics. Um, is that, you know, and I, and I think that's, uh, that's been helpful. Um, Libya, again, doesn't have that luxury. So that's the test case of how this, which way this is going to go. I mean, we'll see if, if it will go that way. Yes? Um, you mentioned that uh, you, you predict that uh, more uh, protesters and stuff in Iran will be more geared towards the Ayatollah. Yeah. Um, considering the sort of respect that he commands from many members of the population and sort of is supposed to be theoretically above the politics, um, would that affect the, their sort of grassroots support or support among many members of the population if they start targeting the Ayatollah as opposed to like the elected members of the government? No, I think um, I think he he doesn't have, actually he's the one figure who probably um, has least credibility with the public at large. Um, you have to remember Khamenei did not have the ideological <coughs> um, credentials to become supreme leader. Uh, he was basically in a point of political uh, choice. Uh, engineered by, um, sorry, I'm going to the specifics here, by the former <coughs> president Rafsan Jani, who ironically ends up being a target of his, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, policies later on. But um, I think uh, the public very much would like the politicians to start turning on him. The question is, those politicians who have been so close to him before, or who are connected in one way or the other, to you know, be it the foundations or the Revolutionary Guard or the Vestige, who we'll get their literally their bread and butter uh, from his kind of benevolent uh, gestures, um, uh, whether they're going to be willing and courageous enough to turn against them. Right now, it doesn't look like it, but Ahmadinejad, you know, no one would have thought that Ahmadinejad would turn against the Supreme Leader in such a public fashion, and he has begun to do so. Um, I don't know how many of you saw the interview with Farid Zakaria last week. Uh, that Ahmadinejad did. But, you know, he talked openly about the political problems he has over there and how the judiciary is not under his control. So if they arrest people, it's really not him. It's an independent institution. That these are all kind of read between the lines. It's not me, it's someone else. You know, I basically, you know, managed to shop here. Um, uh, <laughs> it's, I mean, it was, I, that was shocking to see. I think the only thing that's authentically Ahmadinejad's is his rabid, is anti-Israel, anti-Zionist uh, rants. I think that is uniquely his, and, it's, <laughs> and it's it's perplexing, it's bizarre, it's it's really kooky. But that's I mean that's uniquely him. I mean the Ayatollahs, senior Ayatollahs won't talk like that. They won't. They you know they understand. Maybe one more question. One more question, or <clears throat> say your question. Maybe I'll combine them. Yeah, um, just to satisfy. In, in the context of like something like Tunisia, where you really have a flashpoint and set off on the revolution. How critical do you think it is in Iran in terms of like looking at the green movement and then moving on? How critical do you think flashpoint is mm. in the context of the whole revolution? Okay, good. And, uh, my question was, uh, what has been the domestic reaction to the terror allegations? Oh, uh, right. Um, okay, I'll get to this in a second. <laughs> um, the, uh, in terms of flashpoint, you mean the atmosphere conducive to yeah. a kind of a, a breakout? Um, as I said, I think my guess would be that you have to look at these elections coming up where public frustrations can be expressed in, toward a particular audience. Um, or it has to be some sort of a public scandal. There's been a lot of scandals in Tehran in the last um, a few months involving huge amounts of money being embezzled out of the country uh, to places like Canada or even in, in the United States. Um, uh, so something of that sort. I don't, you know, and, and there's various anniversaries. I mean, Iran is a country of anniversaries. I mean, every week there's something being commemorated. Um, and so I think as you get closer to the anniversary of the kind of the pro-democracy um, crackdowns, uh, you'll see people try to make gestures. But I think um, it'll come sooner than people think. I mean, it's just the, the exposure is that little bit. It can't be sustained anymore. Um, with respect to the allegations, I um, wrote an op-ed about this that the New York Times said they were going to publish, and, they, and then Gaddafi died, and they didn't. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> the, 
Um, uh, it's a very bizarre um, plot, obviously, but it's one of those things that it's so bizarre that it has to be true. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm one of those people who, you know, um, uh, the triangle of um, U.S., um, Iran, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is a, a very bizarre triangle that goes back um, really to the beginning of the, of the um, revolution, but uh, the last sort of a similar episode was the 1996 Hobart Tower bombings, where um, uh, Iran was blamed, mm -hmm. or elements uh, sympathetic to um, uh, Iranian government were blamed for carrying it out. It turns out that it may have been actually early Al-Qaeda that the Saudis didn't want to talk about publicly because they didn't want to show the world that they had this domestic um, uh, problem. Um, and so the Iranians always you know, blame the Saudis for playing this against And this is a very, you know, um, uh, nervous atmosphere for both Iran and Saudi Arabia. But, having said that, the security apparatus in Iran has gotten so out of hand. There are so many, many commanders, people who are trying to make a name for themselves in the elite Quds force of the IRGC or elsewhere, that you may not know. I mean, this guy who was, this guy, Abbasiar, who was supposedly in charge of carrying this out by making connections with the Mexican cartels. And, um, um, you know, uh, that, uh, and whose uncle happens to be a senior commander in the IRGC. Um, you know, may have been propositioned by someone inside Iran who was trying to sort of just feel something out. Um, but I would have a hard time, this is another reason why I think it may have been um, true, I would have a hard time believing the Obama administration going to links, creating a story like this. It must have been, they must have had their hands on real serious intelligence. Uh, to make it go public about this. Don't forget, Ahmadinejad was in uh, the UN a couple weeks before um, this plot was uh, made public. The hikers were released after Ahmadinejad went back, so they waited for the hikers to be released to sort of come out with um, something like this. So it was a very um, um, uh, kind of a study, a study progression of events, and you know, went back all the way to May of last year, so they've been following this quite closely. Um, I think it was one of these things where the Iranians um, trying to distract away from uh, whatever problems might be happening elsewhere, pick a fight, get the U.S. involved. As I said, the U.S. silence has been really irritating for a lot of these um, uh, regimes in the region. They want to have that excuse to say, these are Western plots. This, this is not us, we're not doing anything. And the population is not buying right now, so they may have been fishing for some sort of overreaction. That was my iPad to try to say, don't overreact. Anyway, thank you very much.